Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead. Come, gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who is sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. This is the word of God. You may be seated. Such a sweet voice speaking such intense words. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. Uh, we're in the book of Revelation. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here, and we get to continue on in this book. We're just if you're new or newer, new-ish, uh, Revelation is an intense book. There's lots of details. You could spend a lot of time. What we're trying to do is fly over and see the forest. We're trying to see the big picture of what God's trying to communicate uh, through this book. And we're wrapping it up. We're coming to the end. We've got a few weeks left. And this is sort of a picture of the end of history. And it makes me think, one of my favorite podcasts of the last few years was the one... I think it was this year, J.K. Rowling, there was one called The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling. And it was basically how J.K. Rowling got double canceled in our current cultural moment. She first got canceled by Christian, far-right people who said that sorcery, that witchcraft is no place in my house. So she got canceled by the Christian world. And then fast forward a few years, she made some comments on Twitter and then followed it up with very strong convictions about the transgender community and the transgender phenomenon that we're currently in. And she got canceled again, this time by an entirely different group of people. And in this podcast, she's being interviewed. And she's strongly against the way transgender uh, agenda is being pushed, especially towards young girls. She's obviously a female herself. She has a daughter. And she just says, I think we need to slow down. And she has this line in this podcast, which I'll never forget. She tells the person, what if you're wrong? Like, what if you're wrong? If your desire to allow people to express themselves freely and fully in this particular area where a young person can change their gender, what if you're wrong? And what you're promoting and pushing for is actually doing a lot more damage. What if you're wrong? I mean, I don't know the last time somebody asked you, like, on something, what if you're wrong on this? Like, I wrote a few just, <laughs> this one doesn't matter that much. It's your sports team. What if you're wrong? Arizona sports fans are like, yeah, we've been wrong this entire time. I think of babies. Everyone's having babies, and there's babies everywhere. Sleep training is sort of the first chapter of your story. How do I get this kid to shh and sleep? And you're choosing particular methods or non-methods or whatever you want to call them. And what if you're wrong on your sleep training? Is it that big a deal? Diets. What if keto is a total fraud? <laughs> and you missed out on some great dessert. <laughs> School choice for kids, private, charter, public, homeschool. What if you're wrong? Not that there's a wrong option. Your money and your investments, what if you're wrong? There's a lot of things that you're wrong on. Just let me be the first to tell you if no one's ever told you that, and me too. But what we read in this particular section is something that none of us can afford to be wrong on. It's where history is going. If God is as gracious as I think he is, and he has given us a book so that we would know the most important details about life and death and the life after, this book right here tells us how the end is going to go. And if you're wrong, there are severe, permanent, 
unchangeable consequences to what you think right now about Jesus Christ and how he's revealed in this book here. What if you're wrong? What if you're wrong? Here's my big idea for this particular section here. Is there is a clear right and wrong side of history. What we're going to read is the right and wrong side of history through the lens of victory, resurrection, and reward. That's what we see here. But just so you know, a little caveat, even as we walk through there, there are a lot of details that are a little fuzzy or less clear is what I'd say. There's a clear right and wrong side of history and some less clear details. If you're like a lifer Christian and you've been through the church thing and you've done this, you have some opinions about what I'm about to teach. I promise. Some of you won't agree with what I come to a conclusion of. I guarantee that'll happen. But I want to say those are in the less clear details that we can fight over. But there's some big buckets we must get right before the end of all things. That's my prayer is that we would be clear on the important things. So let's just bow our heads and pray to enter into the space. God, we want to prioritize that which you prioritize. We want to have convictions on that which is fuzzy. We want to hold it with civility. But God, the theme of revelation, we want to be true in this room. We want to see you for who you really are. We want to see this world for what it really is. In all its hope and glory and potential, in all of its deceit and lie and shine. Help us to see through the deceit and see the truth this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said, Amen. So, are you on the right side of history? Victory, resurrection, and reward. First up is victory. So, Revelation 19, 11 through 23 describes the victory that is coming one day. This is not like a spiritual thing that's going to happen. This is a historical thing that's going to happen. If there's historians around at this point, they're going to write it down and say, this is, what ha- this is what is coming. But just to remind you, we're going to walk through these questions. If you're a note taker, here's sort of how I'm going to outline each of these sections. There's going to be something very clear, something less clear, and there's going to be good news in all of this. So what is clear as we read through this? Here's what's abundantly clear. Lauren just read it. There is a victory coming. So let's just read again part of what she read. I want to read chapter 19, verse 11, down through verse 16. This is what we're waiting for. This is the end of it. This is the last page of the last chapter before the new heavens and the new earth. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. And he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. In the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is the end. This is the main character on full display. Look at him. There's a great Maverick City song that just repeats, look at him, look at him, look at him, look at him. Would you just look at him, look at him. Look at him, look at him, his eyes like fire, his hair like wool. Look at him, look at him. And that's what John wants us to do. That's what John couldn't help but do. He just looked at him. And here's the picture of Jesus. Just to recap, he's sitting on a white horse. The first time Jesus came to earth, he was a humble baby born to a poor family in some backwoods place that nobody took notice of. He lives a perfect life, 30-some-odd years of perfection. And he rolls into the town where he is going to be king, Jerusalem. And how does he enter that town on a donkey that has never been ridden? None of that is glamorous. And now we get to the end of the story, and he's sitting on a white horse. And he's called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and he makes war. His eyes are like fire. He sees through it all. Like my wife is the ultimate you-know-what detector. She can just see through it. But she still has limits and a finite ability to see. Jesus, eyes like fire, I mean, he sees it all. There's nothing in any corner anywhere where Jesus is unaware of as he shows back up on the scene. His head has many diadems, and he has a name that no one knows but himself. What is that name? No one knows. 
but himself. Well, what is the point of that? I think there's this reality like even as we get closer and closer to God, there is a mystery about him, a mystery in the divine. Deuteronomy says it like this, the secret things belong to the Lord. Do we know enough to know what we need to know about God? Yes. But is he still the divine, the one who still has mystery, 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 <laughs> mystery, and a name that no one knows but himself? He has a robe dipped in blood. He has a sword in his mouth as he rides up on this horse. And he is described as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Look at him. This is the coming victory. When you're preaching, teaching, there's a theological aspect where you want to be accurate. There's a pastoral piece where you want to be helpful and take the words of Scripture by the Spirit of God and apply them to the life. Some of you in this room are just worried a lot. Some of you are tired. Some of you are struggling. Some of you are losing faith. Some of you are sick of yourselves, sick of this world. And I get it. I would just say, Scripture gives us pictures of Jesus so we can look at him. That does not fix all the little pieces of your story that matter right now. But that's what faith is, is taking our eyes off that which we can see to see that which we cannot see for our good and for his glory. Look at the one sitting, seat, seating on a white horse. But I love this here. He's not alone. He's not a one-man crew, although his crew isn't doing much. Verse 14, here's how we're described in this. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. I love it. King Jesus sitting on the horse. And then behind him, the army of the faithful ones, you and I. What are we doing in this battle of Armageddon? Nothing. We're just following him. What do we look like? We look exactly like we've been described all throughout Revelation. One of the most fascinating things with Revelation is you have these beautifully glorified pictures of Jesus Christ. You have these horrific pictures of sin and evil. The beast, the mother of prostitutes, the mother of prostitutes riding a beast, the dragon trying to kill the woman. And it, like evil is personified in all these crazy graphic ways. Jesus is this perfect one. And then throughout this, you have this group of people, the people of God. And they're always described the same way. Perfect, blameless, wearing white, pure. Who is that? That would be all of you in this room with faith in Jesus Christ. All of you in this room who I know are not pure, blameless, perfect, wearing white in any way, shape, or form. What's the disconnect? That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what makes this different than religion. Religion is like, work hard, work hard, work hard, work hard, work hard. And then maybe one day you'll get to a point where you can kind of express yourself as good enough. As soon as you place your faith in Jesus, you are white, pure, covered completely. Nowhere else do you get that sort of love and forgiveness and cleansing. But that's who's with them. And all they're doing is following him on white horses. My favorite verse through all of Revelation is not what I thought it would be. I thought it would be some glorious picture of Jesus. But it was a few weeks ago, Revelation 14. Here's how the church is described. It's these who follow the lamb wherever he goes. Like I have four kids. I have big dreams for them. Vocationally, relationally, I want them to marry a great woman. I want them, like, for all this. But if that right there is not at the center of my hope for myself, my hope for my family, my hope for this church, I have missed it. I could have everything this world has to offer. I could be the most moral American Christian ever. And if I don't get that, I don't get Jesus. We are the ones who follow him wherever he goes. And we just so happen to follow him into victory as well. But then we also see the other side of victory is defeat. It's which Lauren read and it's, again, very graphic. Let's just read now the other side. Next paragraph, verse 17 and 18. Here's how God describes those who refuse to worship Jesus. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, 
the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, small and great. Yikes. What's happening here? Last week there was this marriage feast between Jesus and his followers. This week there's defeat, and the way it's described is the birds of the air are called to come eat the flesh of those who refuse to worship Jesus. Is it going to be this bad? It'll be worse. John, through his imagery given to him by God and inspired by the Spirit to write this down, is just giving us pictures of that which we can't fully know until we arrive here. And the way he describes separation from God for all eternity is like the birds of the air coming to devour them. And the thing I just want to make note of is both free and slave, small and great. Our cultural moment lives in this, there's oppressed, there's oppressor, there's victims, there's those who create victims, there's, and those become the, the main talking categories in a lot of spaces. Slave and free man. Slave, slave master. Small, great. Every sort of man and woman will be on this side, those who refuse to worship Jesus. We don't get an out because life handed us certain circumstances that we say, but this doesn't apply to us. When we meet him, we're either standing behind him or looking at him facing judgment coming our way. Small and great, free and slave. What about Satan and all that other evil? Verses 19 through 21. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, their armies, gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from his mouth who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds gorged were gorged with their flesh. Smokes. Again, there is a coming victory. There's a king sitting on a horse with his followers behind him. And then there's those that refuse who will be gorged by the birds of the air, whatever that means. I don't care to figure it out personally. But John wants us to be abundantly clear. There is a victor in all this. Now, what is less clear in this? Because this revelation is one passage. You never want to take one passage and create a theology because you can get in danger. But all throughout the New Testament, and especially the words of Jesus, talk about this coming day where there's a separation between the righteous and the unrighteous. So that's very covered throughout all of Scripture. What's less clear is those next three verses is the Satan guy and just how God relates to him through all of this. So let's read chapter 20, verse 1 through 3. Here's the less clear piece of God's victory over Satan. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan. And he bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. So there's victory, white horse, the king, there's defeat. And there's like this little parenthetical moment and Satan is thrown down into the abyss and he's bound and he's covered for a thousand years and then he's released. What is going on there? Satan is bound by God? Here's some questions. If you're like a theological thinker and you've connected the dots, maybe you have answers to this. But was Satan bound in the past? Is this something that already happened? Will Satan be bound in the future? And then the follow-up question is either whatever camp you fall in, what is he able to do once he's bound? That's what just theologians, Christians, people have like wrestled with for a long time. I had a long discussion with my dad over this. Like, what does it mean that he's bound? Here's my take, and I want to say it with full force and full humility. I have changed my take in this area over the last few years through my study of Scripture. So this is not always where I was. But it's where I've currently landed. And just so you know, at our church, this is not something that you have to have figured out. In our membership packet, it says you open-handed issues, end times. How does all this shake out? There are realities that you can decide based off your understanding of Scripture differently than I. But here's what I think. 
Satan was bound at the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you're like, but this world is pretty bad. And I would say, yes, it is very bad. And that's confusing. That's why I say this is less clear. However, even in the scripture, verse 3, he's thrown into the pit. It's shut. It's sealed over him. And then what is the result? He might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. It does not say it's shut, it's sealed so that evil may cease for a thousand years. So Satan's deceptive core, his DNA, the thing that he loves doing is deceiving and tricking, is put on pause for a thousand years. Where do I get this? Jesus says this in the Gospel of John. Speaking about his death and resurrection. Now is the judgment of this world. Now, so this 2,000 years ago, Jesus is saying this. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. That's Satan. And when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. So there's this casting out of Satan so that I can draw all people to myself. Jesus says that about his death and resurrection, imminence. Fast forward in the New Testament, book of Colossians. Paul says this about sin in the gospel. Here's what the gospel is. It's canceling the record of debt that stood against us with all its legal demands. So I have sin in my life. I have a list of sins that is bad and gross and disgusting, and yet it's been placed on the cross. So that's my personal benefit. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. What else did Jesus do in that moment? He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. I think that's also saying, similar to what Revelation is saying, in his death and resurrection, he triumphs over Satan. Not fully, but effectively. Not to the fullest degree, but he is bound right now. That is my take on this. Now you might ask, well, what if you're wrong, Josh? Then you can slap me in heaven. <laughs> or you can, what if I'm right? Then you owe me something, ice cream or something. But <laughs> the reality is there's this progressive nature to how Satan is dealt with by God. I think he's currently bound in a way that makes him less effective than he could be. To one day to be released for a little bit to do more damage. But better than Satan talk, there is good news in this. Like what we're reading here, just, just to remind us, is Armageddon. Every Armageddon, end of life, apocalyptic movie has this like end war between good and evil. This revelation, what we're reading, is the Armageddon. It's the final battle. It's how all this gets dealt with. How messy is this battle? It's surprisingly not that messy. Two things in this passage I want us to see. The blood and the sword. Verse 13 of chapter 19. Let's read about the blood involved in this battle. He is clothed, that would be Jesus, in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. The only blood shed in this Armageddon battle is pre-shed. It's Jesus showing up to the battle covered in his own blood. How is the victory of the world going to be won? Through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It's a done deal. More than that, verse 15. Go to 15. What's the final, like, triumphant ending of all this? Verse 15. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword. Maybe there's going to be blood from this. With which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. So Jesus is on this horse. He's got a sword in his mouth. Why? To pull it out and to defeat people? Kind of. The sword in his mouth is a descriptor of where the power is going to come from to win this battle. From his mouth. When Jesus shows back up, he does not need to hurt anyone. He doesn't need to arm wrestle strength away from Satan. He just needs to speak, and it's over. That's what we're waiting for, Christian. The trumpet to sound, Jesus to descend, and for him to speak, and it's over. How was the world created? God spoke, and the world was. How will the world be recreated? Jesus will speak, and all evil will be dealt with, and the newness will arrive. That's what we're waiting for. 2 Thessalonians says it like this. The lawless one is going to be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and will bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. That is the victory we long for. 
But more than that, there is a resurrection described in here. Again, resurrection. Here's the verses we're going to read, 4 through 10. You got that slide there? Yeah. Next one, just a reminder. Here's what is, we're walking through in each of this. Something's very clear. Something is less clear. There's good news. So let's just read it all, 4 through 10 together to get it on our bones. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life, resurrection, reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life, resurrection, until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in this first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they, those just described, will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Verse 7. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of earth, Gog, Magog, to gather them for battle. Their numbers like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever. Again, that's a mouthful. That's a big picture. What is clear, though, I saw on the thrones and there were those who were, came to life is the description of one, or the other people described as the rest of the dead that did not come to life until after the thousand years has ended. And then John describes this. This is the first resurrection. Here's what Christians believe. There's coming a resurrection. Poor Christian theology teaches a heaven that is disconnected from my earthly existence. Like, I'm just going to go off, my soul's going to be up there, and that's the end game. That's a temporary reality. What we're longing for is a day coming, the second resurrection, the final resurrection, when we are raised again with our bodies, not just Christians, but non-Christians alike, and God will judge and reward all people according to what they did in those bodies, the Bible says. These bodies matter. They're going to get better, thank the Lord, but they matter. Our physicalness matters. We are not just souls with temporary skin. We are mind, body, soul. This is how God made us. This is very clear. What is less clear, as you get into this, there's a thousand years. There's a first resurrection. There's a second death. How does all this fit together? So I just want to walk you through very quickly the views that Christians have held for thousands of years. And we've disagreed for thousands of years. And I personally have changed my mind on over the last few years. So here's, I asked my wife, which one are you, which millennial view do you have she says i don't know so here's her chance to figure out what she thinks about all this here's the first option post-millennialism so in there we read thousand years thousand years thousand years revelation a lot of people just pin revelation to this thousand year thing it doesn't happen until 20 chapters in so it's not the most important thing it's just an element of the whole image but here's what certain people will be especially early american christians Jonathan Edwards, is there's the church age. Jesus dies, then the church kicks in. When does that thousand-year reign happen where Satan's bound and the church gets to enjoy life more fully? At some point, the church is going to kind of tip the scales on society, and society is going to become more and more Christian, and then millennial reign reigns. It's not a literal thousand years. It's just like heaven on earth because the church has done its job so well. And if you're naturally pessimistic like me, you just smirk and say, that's cute. But God-fearing men and women believe that and still believe that. And then after we reign on earth because the church has stepped up, there's a return of Christ and a final judgment, a resurrection to the living and the dead, and then the new heavens and new earth happen for all eternity. That's postmillennialism. I think it's the least seen in Scripture. Here's the second one. This is what I believed. I didn't grow up in the church. My dad becomes a Christian, starts taking me to churches. All the churches I went to believe this. All the men that taught me early on in my faith taught this. So this is like near and dear to my heart. Men I way smarter than me believe this. So there's a church age. We're currently in it. 
When they hear the thousand-year reign and the binding of Satan, it's a future reality coming. There's coming a moment. Some people put a seven-year tribulation in there with the rapture. Those of you that have left behind books that you need to take to Goodwill because they've been sitting around for, that's what all that is. Church age, rapture, gone, seven years of tribulation, and then a thousand years on earth, people are reigning. And then Jesus comes back once and for all, and then eternity. People, God-fearing people believe this. But I think its influence is waning just based off seminaries and the different influences coming in. So if you're from Texas, you for sure believe this. It's required living to be a citizen of the... <laughs> now, just so you know, when they say the first resurrection, what they're saying is the rapture, and then there's a reigning during this thousand-year reign. So I'll take it to this one. Again, I'm not going to fight about this. If you want to discuss it, I'd love to. But the final one is all millennialism. It doesn't mean no millennial. It just means the church age and that thousand year are the same thing. When John says, a thousand years of reigning where Satan is bound, it's while the church is alive and active on this earth. Well, how long is it? As long as God wants it to be. Only the Father knows the hour, Jesus says. Well, then what's all this resurrection talk? I tend to think this first resurrection, those that have died, with their faith intact in Jesus Christ, are now reigning with him during this millennial reign while Jesus is king of all things, but he just happens to be sitting in heaven until one day his throne is going to come down and take residence here on earth. And then when that happens, there's a final judgment, final resurrection, and then eternity starts. This is how Christians throughout thousands of years have debated the thousand years. Is it important? Yes. Do people disagree with me? Yes. Do I disagree with some people? Yes. Do your work. If you want to fight me on it, meet me outside after church, <laughs> and we will do this. We will do this. But seriously, in all humility, I was not believing this four years ago. And especially reading the book of Revelation and doing my darndest to try to see like literal meaning to this. It just keeps making more and more sense of the symbolic nature of this thousand year reign. But that's me. It's not a theological statement our church makes. It just is what it is. But the resurrection is coming. What's the good news for us Christians? Say you don't know. Say you're like my wife and like I still don't know. Like I taught that pretty clearly. You didn't pick one of those. I still don't know. Well, let me teach it again. You sit down on the couch. Let's go over these again. 60% of you walk out of here, you don't have a conviction. 20% of you disagree with me. 10% like, ah, oh, that was interesting. 10% like, what's for lunch? That's the makeup of this room. Verse 6 says, blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. Whether we're talking about physical death, which we all face, or spiritual death, which comes to those who are separate from God. The Christian, blessed are you, who will partake in the first resurrection. Your physical death will just be sleep, the New Testament calls it. You'll take a nap, and your soul will be united with him. And then the second coming, when everyone is raised in their earthly bodies to be judged before God, we have nothing to fear, even over that second death. It has no power. Our resurrection is secure, Christian. Like, I get humility, but Jesus is pretty clear, be humble. But I think Christians need a little more swagger. Like, nothing is stopping us. Physical death, nope. God's judgment, nope. We've got it covered. We are following him who was resurrected first, Jesus Christ. I'm behind the one on the white horse. That's my guy. Nothing can stop you. That's what the Bible teaches. And Revelation wants you encouraged as we round out this book that has been so intense. Christians, you should be fired up. Nothing can stop me. Yeah, but my life still, I get it. But he is coming back, and you're going to join him in the resurrection. And that takes us to our final thing. Well, what do we get in this resurrection? Is there a reward? Again, what's clear? I would say yes, there's judgment and reward. What's confusing? There's a lot of books involved. And what's the good news? So what's clear? Verse 11 and 12. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. And from his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And the books 
were opened. What's clear from Scripture is there's coming a judgment day. Jesus talks about it as much as he talks about anything. His parables are all kind of tied up in this reality. Romans 2 says, we are going to give an account for everything we've done in our flesh. For those of us who have done good, we will receive mercy and honor and glory. For those of us who have done ill, punishment and separation. All of us face this. This is a very clear teaching of Scripture. What is confusing, starting in verse 12, there's books opened. And if you keep reading, then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. So everyone that's dead, the sea is like the way to say we've covered all our bases. There's not like a secret dead body that's going to miss out on the resurrection. Like, where's Uncle Joe? I don't know. We, we cremate and throw him in Mount Lemon in Tucson. No, he's there too. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown in the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. John, what is it? Is there a book of life? Or is there books that are open that tell everything about my life? Good, bad, and ugly. Yes and yes. And just, you know, coming from a Catholic-ish background where God was like always behind the door and always frustrated with me. I feared this big time. So when I entered into Christianity and put my faith in Jesus and people told me about grace, unmerited uh, favor from the Lord, total forgiveness, righteousness that's not yours, that's been given to you, I took it, yes. And early on in my Christian faith, I never thought about the books of my life. I just thought one day I'm going to see them and I get in because I'm in the book of life. Some of you are like that. That's a good thing. But that's an overcorrection. The Bible teaches there are also books that contain everything. Ecclesiastes says it like this, every thought, every deed, every motive, every word, every action, every payment, every use of time, every click, everything will be laid bare at judgment day. No exceptions. The books. And then there's a book of life. So where is the good news for us in this? Christian, I don't want you to jump too quickly to just say, I'm in the book of life. I'm in the book of life. Because some of you might not be. We decorated our house yesterday for Christmas. Really sweet. Mostly sweet. Tree's up. My five-year-old is just staring at, like, all the lights are just like, this is the greatest thing. And he's staring at the tree. It's almost bedtime. And he he grabs the nativity ornament. So it's all homemade ornaments. It's all the things our kids have made over the years. No fanciness, just homemade. And then there's a nativity. And he asks my wife, is this the most important ornament? And the answer is yes. But all these other ones matter too. And I feel like if you just focus on the book of life and Jesus Christ, come the first time, coming a second time, and you flatten what the Bible does not flatten. You can be in the book of life by grace. What's interesting, how do you get in the book of life? You are written there by a hand that is not your own. That is called grace. God's sovereign grace. You are in Joshua James Watt. But I didn't deserve it. I wrote it. The book of life. You're in it. How? By faith in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. That's it. Any of you in this moment can receive that. But then. He does not flatten our life and say, and all you got to think about is Jesus. He says, now go follow the lamb wherever he goes. And now we have these books of our life with all the bad covered in red blood by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we have all these deeds that we're now doing as we try to faithfully follow him. And one day they're going to be open and we will be rewarded. But if you are not in the book of life, all God has to open on you is your life to be presented before him. And a holy, perfect, good, and righteous judge cannot turn a blind eye to all the bad in there. But you can have that covered by him who shows up at the final battle, covered in his own blood, which he willfully chose for you and for me. This is where history is headed. Are you on the right side of history? 
just a few people in this room, I think, need some encouragement. Christian, you're probably wrong on some of the details of this book, but you have the important one. He's coming back on a horse, and you're going to be behind him and enjoy eternity forever. The next group of people, a non-Christian in here who knows that you are not a Christian. I wrote these things as I thought about you. There are some things in life that get discussed and debated too much. Jesus Christ and his role in history is not one of those things. He is coming back. He will separate the faithful ones from those who rejected him. And that separation is not a temporary thing, but it's permanent. And the one on the white horse will confirm and affirm all that. But then here's the one my heart goes out to, the Christian in this room. Those who think they're Christian. We got a growing church. We've got people coming in here from a variety of backgrounds. And some of you overassume your faith because of your family heritage, your background, the fact that as I look at all the religious options on the checks, I'm not any of those, so therefore I'm Christian. Here's how Christians throughout this entire book are described those who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. If you don't follow him now in real faith, one day you're going to see him and you're going to be not behind him, but staring at him as he gets off his horse to sit on his throne and judge you once and for all. This is where history is going. We can debate it all we want, but God in his kindness has given us so we would know, so that you could be on the right side of history and I could be on the right side of history. And we can long for the day where Jesus comes back. Amen? Let's pray, church. God, thank you for this book that's full of so many images we could spend a lifetime. Yet it's full of the important details. And it packs a lot into a little bit of space. And even in this little section, God, all of us are facing the same future. That our own lives are coming to an end. Physical death tells us that. And your word tells us that this whole world is facing its own physical end. That judgment is coming. But just like our own physical deaths, it's not the end of the story. There is a resurrection coming that we Christians long for, we hope for. As we sit in these frail, finite bodies and lives, as we struggle to trust you in the circumstances you have us in, as we long for you to step in in ways to answer prayers that we've prayed up for a long time now. God, I pray this moment just gives us a little more confidence of the firmness and the foundation that we have. That he is coming back, seated on a white horse, covered in the blood that covers us now by faith, ready to make all things new and to reward us for lives live faithfully following him. God, for those in this room who need to know you, I pray they would not overcomplicate this, that they would place their faith in you and that they would take a step of faith towards you. By your spirit, make that happen. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.